and the quarry of permafrost and ice is growing around the perimeter of the hole. But it's slow going, even with everyone pitching in. There's an unforeseen glitch. Their generator isn't strong enough to power tools. But it's not the only problem. The block size is an issue. They must reduce it without damaging the animal inside. And soon Bernard will have to calculate the block's weight to know if he can lift it. If his luck doesn't change, he risks losing the mammoth to the winter again. But the winds have shifted. Somehow, somewhere, in a Hatanga junkyard, Anatoly has managed to rustle up a new generator, bigger and more powerful than the last, and just in the nick of time. It doesn't take long for the men to switch it on, move the equipment into place, and make all the connections. The compressor will be used to power the tools that should make the work go a lot faster. But there's no fire behind the spark. There's only one thing to do. Call the expedition hotline in Hatanga. Fortunately, the doctor is in. While Nikolai, one of the Russian workers, takes note, Anatoly reveals the secrets of working with his latest electronic antique. It turns out that it's nothing serious. A little sleight of hand with a couple of connecting wires, and the team may be in business. The din of the jacket is deadly. But the permafrost is stubborn, giving way grudgingly to the forces of iron and steel. Finally, the men begin to make up for lost time. The trench around the mammoth is getting deeper, and any day now the animal may burst out. The sound of jackhammers is the signal for the expedition leader and the scientists to brace themselves against the cold and head for the mammoth site. From here on in, the men will work under the constant supervision of Deke and Bernard. They've become guardians of the animal, taking shape under their eyes. Their vigilance is rewarded when the first wiry hairs poke from the side of the block. Deke can barely contain his excitement at the signs of life making their way to the surface after thousands of years underground. You go through the damages made by the jackhammer, you see that this was never disturbed. So this must be the original clay layer in which the mammoth was buried. There are few clues to the world of the Jarkov mammoth. What is known comes from radiocarbon dating and analysis of the tusks, teeth, and pollen samples around the hair salvaged from the first expedition. The evidence shows that it's a 47-year-old male that died some 20,000 years ago. 
After the animal is unearthed, new tests will be performed on its tissue and bones. Ah, oh, this is beautiful. 20,380 years ago, this animal died, and now I'm riding on its back. Everywhere here, everywhere. Hundreds, thousands. This is beautiful. Now, so close to the flesh, Bernard urges caution. The men must continue to reduce the block's weight without exposing the animal. Once flown off the tundra, the mammoth will be preserved in its frozen state for scientists to study in a less hostile environment. Hair is visible on all three sides of the block, signaling the last phase of the dig is near. Burrowing under a block, the weight of four woolly mammoths won't be easy. But even if it can be done, lifting it may be problematic, and Bernard is concerned. And it is the huge helicopters coming to... Yeah, yeah. Is it easy then to make the cables to the helicopter? Yeah, it's, uh, I have a lot of uh, small problem because I have always... The Russian told me, yes, we have, yes, it's OK, yes... Uh, but many times it works, but many times it not works the first time, you know. Now the problem we have, because this big helicopter who will we'll make the... It, yeah, yeah. Cannot take more than 26 tons. 26? Yeah, 26, it's a, this is the size of a, of a block. We have up 26, 30 tons now. But it's the first time we do this. It's week three on the Taimir. A helicopter bearing supplies and a few curious onlookers flies low over the campsite. After days of nothing but the sound of jackhammers and arctic wind, the men on the ground are equally mesmerized by the chopper. The pilot's ritual is always the same. He can't resist buzzing the sight to see how the block is shaping up. They've gotten so close now that the scent of ancient animal is in the air. I will smell it, see if it smells. It's a little bit cold, but I can tell you it smells. It smells really. Right now my nose is so cold I don't think I This is exceptional for me because for the first time I can touch the hair of the animal that I've been uh, pursuing that's still in place in the ground. And when I see it here and there and over there, then uh, I'm very impressed. Very impressed yeah. <clears throat> I've got bones, I've got teeth, I've got tusks, and in one case we even found the dung of mammoths. But I've never been where I can pet the hair that's still attached to the animal. It's an emotional experience that uh, probably you don't have quite as deeply unless you've been hunting mammoths for over 30 years like I have. Ideally, if everything worked properly, maybe we can clone this animal and then I can actually pet the living animal. But right now, to pet the hair of this mammoth is kind of the, the height of mammoth hunting. <coughs> to gather fleece and hair of an extinct woolly mammoth is a unique thrill, but especially for foreigners banned from Siberia for decades. Don't hit the animal. <laughs> the men refrain from taking soft yes, tissue for now. <laughs> Later, the mammoth will move to the ice caves in Hatanga. <laughs> 